out where these folks are from. Let's launch this poll. Charlotte, if you'd be good enough to put that poll into action, we'll find out where people work. Okay, uh, 25 out of 28, one more, because it wouldn't count me. There you go, let's share the results. Okay. Wow, all right. This is fascinating. So now, uh, I, I just gotta know, can we have two volunteers to tell us what your other is? Yeah, let's hear it, Richard. Uh, so I'm in the UK system, so it's uh, um, the terms don't fit for um, for the system that I'm in. But I, I work with um, uh, well up to eighteen year olds, um, and uh, so yeah, secondary education here in the UK, uh, mostly um, private schools, independent schools, but a little bit with the state sector. Um, and uh, yeah, just just I've had a few university aged students that I've worked with on one to one level with with strengths coaching. Um, but um, yeah, certainly keen to see if I can play with uh, uh, universities in the UK. OK, excellent. Thank you. Let's hear one more. Hey, Ken, can you hear me? I sure can. Is that George? Hi, this is. Yeah, this is George. I'm in uh, <clears throat> Southern California. I don't work in education. I'm a new certified strengths coach. Uh, I do have, uh, you know, quite a bit of experience mentoring high school and college kids, primarily through my daughters and their friends. And I just thought this was a fascinating topic. And because I think it's so important for, for anybody to learn their strengths as early as possible in their life. So I'm, I'm, I want to be a sponge if I could, please. George, we, uh, I think everybody on this panel would agree with you. So we're glad you're here. Okay. And thank you. And by the way, I think you're in Kalamazoo. I worked in Kalamazoo for many years. I uh, went to school at Western Michigan. Oh, okay. I went to grad school there. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Folks, raise your hand if you like order and structure. Amy does, Cheryl does, Gail does, Beth does, Stephen Anthony does, Katie, thank you. Okay, all right, well, this next part's for you, okay? I'm gonna do a share screen. Now we're gonna take a look at this PowerPoint. This is just for you. All right. Okay. I'm Ken Barr Jr. I realize not all of you know me. My top five strengths are input, maximizer, arranger, woo, and learner. And this is a picture of me when I worked in higher ed. And you could probably tell from the facial expression, it is a mixture of hope, wonderment, and exasperation. So let me thank all of you in advance for everything that you do to foster student success. Now let's talk about what we're gonna talk about. So this is a picture of me when I was in college. It's kind of like that Where's Waldo. Raise your hand if you can spot me, if you found me already. George is on it, okay. Let me help you guys out, bam. This was the mid 90s, which was great for R&B music and hip hop, but not quite as cool for fashion. Mm. All right. Oh, another little input for those who lead with high input. I have nearly 70 cousins on my mom's side of the family. So I come from a huge family. And the other wow. thing that I really love to talk about is R&B music. Classic soul, rhythm and blues. This is the group After Seven, for those who are familiar with After Seven. And anybody that wants to have a sidebar conversation after this, 
about R&B and hip hop, just, just stay on the, stay on the call. Okay. All right. Here's that flexible outline for those who like order and structure. So the first part that we're going to do is I've come up with a, what I would call the FAQ. These are the topics that most people have the most questions about when we talk about this at conferences and when I do consultations with colleges and universities. So I just chose two or three of them. We'll discuss them briefly and then we're going to ask your input from your experiences. And then here's the second part for those who like a little more go with the flow. Whatever else you want. There'll be an opportunity for questions. And I will be certain to give you the short answer during this session. And for people who want to learn more, we can connect on LinkedIn or Twitter and continue the dialogue. Everybody ready to rock? Okay. I can't hear you or see you, so I'm assuming that you're ready. Thanks. Okay. Best practices. The very first one that I'm gonna talk about and actually, I'm going to go, I'm going to get a wider view because I need to take a look at your faces here. Okay. So raise your hand if you've ever had problems with your students actually just taking the assessment. Yeah, just put your hand up high. If you've ever had problems where you've distributed an access code and said, here, take this on Tuesday. And then when you come to class on Thursday, we're going to talk about the results. Raise your hands if you've ever had issues with that. Okay, that is, oh my goodness, that's almost all of us. Andrea Davis, I see your hand and I feel you. Okay, Laurie, yeah, I know you. Ivy Tech, yep, yep, it's a handful. Okay, all right. So here's the thing that I'm, I had those problems too, and I've analyzed this. And 15 years ago, when we first started doing this, we thought you could hand an access code, which back then was like 10 bucks. Like, yeah, you just give a student, here are the instructions, and then come back with the results. And consistently, 50% of the students would be able to take the assessment, access the reports, and be ready to have a conversation about it. So after you do that two or three times, you'll be like, there's got to be a better way. And there is a better way. Hey, so I'm in a session. Can I call you back? Uh, sure, sure. All right. Just leave your number in the chat. Okay. Thanks for that. So let's talk about uh, some best practices here. I'm going to go back to screen share just because this is the kind of thing if you're into taking notes, you're going to want to take notes on. All right. So what we're gonna talk about is group assessment and group inter interpretation. So what I mean by that is this, and uh, any opportunity that you get where you can get 25 students and manage a lab where you can all take the assessment at the same time, the reason that is best practice is because you're going to be able to give all of the students at the exact same time, here are the instructions. And you can do any kind of troubleshooting and make sure that everybody gets through in about five or 10 minutes. And what happens is people will spell strengths and they'll flip the T and the H. Uh, <laughs> it's a ridiculously long string of digits. I, I apologize on behalf of Gallup, you know, X, nine, L, eight, blah, blah, blah. But you can help them by just saying, here's the thing, or I'm going to say it and you type it or vice versa. But effectively, in about 45 minutes to an hour, whoever you take to that lab, everyone's going to have their results and you will be able to help them navigate the resources that are on the website. Now, let me also tell you why that's important is because for most of us, when students take the strengths assessment, they see the website as a kind of one, one time destination. They think that their mission is to go there, take the assessment and then immediately close out of it and never return again. Just nod your head if you know, if you know what I'm talking about, if you feel me. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Andrea. 
Gina, I see you there. So you get to, when you have the chance to take them through that group assessment, you get to show them exactly how to navigate to the reports and the resources that you want to use first. And it's super important because the other thing that happens so often is that the student absolutely forgets their username and password or both. One more best practice for those that are taking notes. When they take the assessment, just go ahead and have them write down their username and password. Their username is almost always their email. And I'm not a stickler. If you want them to use their uh, Aquinas College email, you go ahead and do that. What I ask them is use the email address that you use most frequently. What questions do you have so far? No questions in chat yet. Okay. But anybody got any vocally that you just want to unmute and ask? Yeah, I have a question. It's Andrea. Um, I, um, I actually probably should have answered other in the poll because although I work in higher education, um, I actually work for um, a mid-sized nonprofit um, and physically we're on campus, we're located on campus, but we don't have access to necessarily to like a lab uh, where we can go and do the assessment. Do you have any suggestions about what other kinds of means if we wanted to do that sort of en masse, um, how we could do that? So do you still have access to the students physically in math? Physically, yeah. So like, it's just that we don't have the, the, the resources to have like our own computer lab. It might be possible to um, maybe, I don't know, book something. It really depends, you know, because yeah. we're not the same as the university, uh, but we do collaborate on things sometimes. Yeah, Andrea, I can tell you that you have access to libraries almost always now two or three computer labs, or they'll have something that they refer to as a, a COW, which is an acronym for Classroom on Wheels, which will have anywhere between 20 and 30 laptops and a printer all in this cool cart. Raise your hand if you've ever seen the, the COW. Anyone ever heard of that? Okay, Alyssa. So if you give them that little shorthand or just ask, some people have access to Chromebooks, which are a little bit smaller, and actually students are a little, they're a little more, they're a bit quicker with it. And or simply just ask <laughs> one of the schools. People tend to be a bit more generous with the resources, particularly if they know that you're going to help students discover their strengths. Does that help, Andrea? Yeah, thanks. All right, cool. Now, the second part of this is a group interpretation of the results. And what we mean by that is it's awesome. I know so many of us are having a great time having one-on-one -on -one conversations with students to help them find out a little bit more about their results. But there is something much different, and by different, I mean more engaging, when students get a chance to have these conversations in the company of their peers. And what it looks like is it sparks a little bit of curiosity because they know each other. Let's say if you do this as part of a, a sports team, you may have 12, 12 people and they've already know each other to begin with, but now they're curious about, well, what does George have? What does Cheryl have? And what, what does that mean to have relator or restorative? or responsibility. And so the conversations and the group activities tend to have higher energy and they're just motivated in a different way to engage in the learning because they're with their friends or at a minimum with people who are their peers. What questions do you have about that? Yeah, this is the collaborative part. I have a question. <laughs> you know, me, I always have questions. It's my ideation. Here we go. Um, have you done this yet? Is a group uh, taking the assessment through Zoom or virtually online? I'm thinking about doing some workshops this summer 
and we can't get back on campus or the youth groups I'm working with can't get together. So have you tried it virtually yet while they're doing the assessment together or does that work? Yeah. Yep. And what happens, the best practice with that is to effectively just screenshot the what they're going to have to navigate to. Uh, some people will do it in re real time. Like if you want to just burn an access code and take it through at the exact same time, mainly because it is just a ton of uh, demographic information that they have to go through. Or you can take a screenshot of here's page one. Here's where you got to go to. But it, it does work. What you want to do, though, is make sure that you just give yourself enough time because you will get questions or you'll get they will say out loud i'm not there i'm not I'm not at there or if you're using the interface the clifton strengths for students they end up just searching and google or chrome will just take them to gallup's other websites okay we've got a couple of people mention about phones or students taking it on their smartphones is that something that you advise that they they don't or do you have a large portion of people that that sort of do and it's just navigating that differently? Yeah, that's a great question that I'm going to give you an honest answer to. And what we always say is best practice is to find a bigger screen. I, they're, they're so used to using the phone, it's practically strapped to their hand, but the screen is not optimized for being able to take a look at the, the questions. So and everything that we're talking about here, this is to make things easier and to make sure that you get access to the reports faster. So can they do it? Yes. Do we recommend it? No. Marilyn also had a question about, um, do you recommend that people use their own personal email address as opposed to a college email address so that after they graduate, they can still you know, easily access? What's, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I do, mainly because... I, there's two things that will help, and I want everyone to think about this somewhat globally. The two most important things is having the student take the assessment and then being able to retrieve the results so that you can have developmental, leadership, career, any kind of student development coaching with them afterwards. So they got to take the assessment and they got to have access to the results. So I will give you a bunch of tips on how to access it, but yeah, just let them use their personal email because that's the thing that they're going to be most familiar with. That's a great question, by the way. Who asked that? It's Carolyn. Hey, hi. I don't have my video on today, but yes, my name is Carolyn. Well, you just got extra credit. So congratulations. <laughs> I'll take it. Well, since I am speaking with you, I am, so I'm newer entering into the student arena. And so since I typically work with adults, um, my question is, is, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around if it's a Zoom or virtual call that the kids are all taking the assessment at that same time. So just kind of hanging out while they're taking the assessment for that 35 to 40 minutes. But if I'm interpreting you, that's what you're recommending as a best practice. No, I let, let me clarify that. Okay. It, what we're talking about is old school, getting the students in a computer lab of some kind and doing group assessment. In these times of the pandemic, we do what we can with what we have. And so you can provide structure through a Zoom call and it just looks like on a big slide. You can say, now we are going to take 45 minutes to 15 minutes to take the assessment. And they just have to control T, open up another tab, and then fill in the instructions and take the assessment. They can still be on it. Everybody can be on mute. And you can actually go to the screens and you can take a look at the progress bar. I mean, that's next level. There's part, again, there's got to be a little bit of trust with the audience. But I mean, at this point, everyone who's taken it should be somewhere either 14 or 15 years old or older. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, that's good. I'm wrapping my head around what you're saying. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure, of course. 
Of course. All right. Now, so what I was just saying remains true and probably will always be true, that your primary objective is to create access for students to be able to take the assessment and also to be able to have access to the results. Does that make sense to everyone? Steven, did you get that? Okay, thanks for the nod. So I want you to think of it, I used to work in hospitality. And so uh, in the restaurant, you might be able to serve, let's say at lunchtime, maybe 250 people. But I think in contrast, if you were to do a banquet event, you might be able to serve 2,500 people, even if the lunch hour is still an hour. And so I want you to think about when you're maximizing your human resources, that that group, inter that group assessment and group interpretation is going to allow for the most students to get access and for you to then have, let's call it a bank of students that you can work with to do whatever it is your specialty area. So here's what we're gonna do. So let me, I'm gonna do a screen share real quick and I'm gonna just tell you some very popular, popular gateways for how we can get students to, to take the assessment. Okay, so in a second, we're gonna break everybody out into breakout rooms. And in your breakout room, you are gonna come up with some ideas. But for the purpose of the, us having the slide and having access to it, we're gonna use the annotate function right now. And you're gonna select a stamp. And I want you to put a stamp next to any of the options that you have at your school that could provide a gateway for students to take the strengths assessment. Couple of questions that are coming up, Ken, um, as people fill that out is, what would you say the maximum number of students that you would work with in a group for facilitation? Another question is, who pays for the assessment and your time? So there's just two questions there that when you, when the right time works for you. Sure, sure. Okay. Oh, wow, okay. We've got a ton of options then. So, this is unique for me in that I don't necessarily get immediate feedback from you. So to close the loop, these check marks and stars and hearts, one, remind me of the serial luck of charms. And secondly, give affirmation that you have a ton of access on campus. So I'm gonna do a stop share here, bring us back. Did anyone have a bowl of lucky charms today? Did it, anyone start the day with that? No? Okay. Alyssa, thanks for smiling. The empathy, that was nice. So what we're going to do is we're going to put you into breakout rooms and we actually want you to brainstorm. So just two, three, four, five courses that you have the potential to integrate strengths into that could act as a gateway for your students to take the assessment. And after we do that, I promise I will answer the other two questions. So if we'll put them into breakout rooms and let's just, let's put them on the clock. Let's give them uh, four minutes, four minutes. How many, how many do you want in a breakout room, Ken? Let's do four, four and four. Okay. I'm gonna go, even numbers, we're gonna go four, four to five. And I, and I reserve the right to end it sooner. Like if I just see they're killing it, then we're just gonna wrap it up. Okay. Yep, 
you might get put in a room, Ken, and you can then jump back out and I can put you in whatever room you like. summit the other day i did yeah i stayed up until about 2 a.m and then uh, then went to bed and then woke up again in the morning pretty, pretty, pretty fascinating yeah okay everybody all right did anybody get more than 12. More yeah than that wasn't near enough time I just wondered if there was someone out there with like that hyper achiever competition or maximizer, if they're like, oh, yeah. you know, my ideation is going crazy. It's like, ah. Okay. Did anybody get more than five? Bria, did you get more than five? Yeah, I'm sure we have like 50 in our group. Um, Lori's just, just rattling them off. So. We were probably, I would say, 15 or 16. Okay, Bria. All right. Your prize is also in, in the email. Maybe and it's all Lori. She was, she was the one. <laughs> it was all Lori. Okay. So the outcome of this exercise, one, to take advantage of your vast experience. But I want you to think about, this. like, part of this, you're going to, listen, I mean, some of you I hear, a lot of you work on the student affairs side and not as many on the academic side. But we all know who, <clears throat> who runs the show on campus. So if you get even two or three influential instructors on your campus to have this be a part of their curriculum, their influence can go a long way toward getting other faculty members to integrate it into their course. Now, some of you may be asking like, well, integrate, what are you talking about? Every single course that you have has learning objectives and all you need to do in order to get in on that is to align and say, this tool can help you accomplish this learning objective. And if you do it the KBJ way, which is high woo, high maximizer, and high arranger, it's we will do all the heavy lifting. We'll do the group assessment, we'll do the group interpretation, we'll have one-on-ones with each of your students, we'll go over their resume with them for you, all of that. You make it very difficult for them to say no. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Me. Okay. Yes, thank you, George. I think that... Uh, I think once you get a couple, I mean, I've worked with professors most recently with groups of students that have traveled from Michigan to Southern California. And I've set this group of students up with company visits so they could have some experiential learning. And uh, what I found is that uh, at this, at this particular university, Western Michigan university, uh, certain uh, professors and deans I mean, they have their own budget, they have their own fundraising. If you can get one or two of them uh, into, the, into the Clifton strengths and get, a, get 10 to 20 students to take that, uh, then they, obviously they have a lot of influence with other professors. Uh, I, can, I can definitely see that as a yeah. cascading effect. Yeah, spot on, spot on. Again? Yes. We also talked about, uh, we had several in our group that were uh, working with employees rather than students. They're in higher ed, but they're working in the employee side. So I talked to them about, um, we had workshops on intro to Ivy Street. Our, our, our school's called Ivy Tech Community College. So we Ivy everything and ours is Ivy Strengths. And so we did intro to Ivy Strengths to give everybody their strengths and then how to interpret their results. That's an intro kind of workshop, professional development workshop. We did, uh, beyond that, we talked about strengths-based leadership. So we broke everybody in their domains. How can we use that per department? 
what's your department look like? Is it all in the same domain? How can you mix that up a bit? How can you uh, leverage the strengths you have in that department and make it more efficient and, and um, a cohesive? And then also strengths and conflict. How can you use conflict styles and leadership? And how does your how do uh, conflict styles and strengths and how do your strengths then impact your conflict style and also the people you work with? And so you've got lots of options, even in professional development with conflict resolution, with team building, with, um, uh, I forget where I was going with this, <laughs> leadership domains, all of those. Uh, so there's even lots of things you could do with your employees on your campus as well. So just, I'll throw that out there. <laughs> and if you need more ideas, just call me. I've got plenty. <laughs> yeah. Your ID have lots. is totally evident and we appreciate it. And all of that is, you're able to do it because you create access to take the assessment. The students have their reports or somehow encode their results. And then where you want to go developmentally, you can create multiple touch points on campus, which we'll talk about just a little bit later. I want to answer the two questions. Charlotte, would you be good enough to share those with me again? The two sure. questions. That they were, who pays your assessment and your time? And the other one was, what would you say the maximum number of students that you would work with in a group for facilitation? Yeah. So the first one, I'll just give you a really generic answer and it just varies. Some people, it comes from, it just comes from your student affairs. It's, uh, it's hard line money. Other people use grants in order to start. Other people will do uh, an internal grant like an innovative thinking. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, that's definitely a sidebar if you're looking for help with how to, how to get the cash. The second one, when we're talking groups, like a group interpretation of their results, uh, anywhere between 24 and 30 some, we've definitely done it bigger. We've gone 50, we've gone 100, but the, more, the bigger it gets, the more you're going to have to do pair and share, small groups, you're not gonna hold their attention for 90 minutes if you're just, just talking. Uh, another question, Ken, uh, and, and uh, I don't work with students and I'm, I'm intrigued um, from, for all of you. People more work with top five or full 34 within the corporate setting now. I, I pretty much only work full 34, but do people work with five or 34? On campus, top five. I mean, it, it still gets, it still takes time for people to get their head around the five. Yeah. And yeah. I, cost is one of those things too, that protects you. If you're a public school, that your pockets aren't usually aren't as deep. So, but you say, yeah, I do love this. So yeah, we'll do the top five. Cool. Yeah, Any still. questions out there? Okay. All right. Okay. So now we're going to do another. Bria, are you, are you singing to us or was that? Okay. I'm, I'm driving. I have a quick question. Okay. All right. We're ready. I just, I realized my microphone was on mute and I'm just like asking my question. Um, do you know, does Gallup offer independent coaches the um, the education discount, or does the school have to purchase the codes for me to use with them? Yeah, so their criteria is that you could get the uh, you can get the discounted codes if you use and register a .edu email address. They oftentimes will follow up with you to just ask about the work, but it's not it's not super comprehensive. So usually just showing that so you if, work for it. So if I'm working with a school, I would just ask them to give me an email address so that I can yeah. purchase those codes for them. And what is the discount for a .edu versus the certified Gallup discount? You, you can get it for, I think it's 12, 12 or $13. Oh. So here's the other thing too. Even if you can't get it, just think strategically a ranger, and just have them order it with using, they can register their Clips and Strengths yeah. for Students right, and use their email. And then they just, they just yeah. share the results with you, is that it? 
there, there's a few different ways that you can access it, but that's the kind of thing too. Like if you were, there's, we could have two hours on just the technical side. So George, why don't you connect with me and I'll make sure that you have everything you need if you need to get started with it. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions before we move to the next frequently discussed topic? All right. I have a question. We're ready, Gina. Okay. So I asked in the um, chat, but I was just curious, do you use any of the Gallup books for students in your curriculum? Like I love Strengths Quest and I love um, Strengths for Students. I'm just curious, are you guys purchasing the books and using the codes? Are you um, having the books as part of your curriculum? That's my question. Yeah, yeah the, the answer is yes. And I'm pretty old school. I'm from Muskegon. If anybody knows where that's at, we are really good at maximizing our resources because we don't have a lot. And yeah. uh, our move <laughs> was to one, get the discounted codes. Secondly, those old Strengths Quest techs, you can still buy those from Amazon in their marketplace. I mean, some of them, they're like a dollar. You might have to pay two or three bucks in shipping, but we will use those or we use the PDFs and just print it. So chapter 10 is on career exploration and planning. And we just take certain pieces from that. But yes, now, of course, all of the students have access to the Clifton Strengths for Student book that Tom Matson wrote. And so they can, they can do that through Kindle. There's a few different options that they have right from the website. Does that help, Gina? Yeah, that's advanced technique, by the way, using that book, so. All right. We'll do another share screen. Good work, by the way, on your brainstorming. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some other really popular gateways. And I can tell already that a lot of you folks were there. We talked to Chance at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee, and they have already worked with 50 different RSOs, registered student organizations. So I just want everybody to keep thinking about the more gateways that you have, the more you increase the likelihood that students will be able to take the assessment, have access to the results, and then you can do what you do developmentally. So for this one, instead of the breakout room, let's just do an annotate real quick and let's see what you have available on your campus. If you have any of the ones that are listed, go ahead and put a stamp next to it. Okay, a lot of res life. Okay, RSO, okay, good. Wow, look at this person way over, I don't know what, okay, it's gone. <laughs> Okay, yes. Now, now let's just do this open-ended. Who has a gateway on their campus, and I know there's a lot of other, that would be a unique opportunity for you to have access for students to take the assessment? Go ahead and unmute and just share it with the group. Yes, some of you have an awesome idea. And once you make it explicit, the other people in this group will be able to grab it and use it. And I am more than so, willing to give an idea, but I will let someone else go first. <laughs> Lori, that is gracious. Very gracious. We, we actually give it to the freshmen during welcome week, the first week of school. Really? How many students? About 600. Whoa. Yes. Okay. All right. How do you execute that? Do that with 800, yeah. I was actually, I work with Beth and I'm a welcome week leader. So sorry to interrupt you, Beth. <laughs> um, but each welcome week leader is trained specifically on how to do this um, in certain sessions by a strengths coach or a leader. 
and then we have a strengths learning session with each of our groups about 20 to 30 kids and they all take it in a lab like you recommend it actually wow you see my hands clapping there in the in the corner that's good stuff Alyssa, beth jan 800 plus that's terrific we do um a um i i do we have postgraduate teaching assistants who are phd students and uh, I run a one day workshop with them and they kind of roll on a cycle so they usually stay for two years and um, some of them have already been to the doctoral training centre where we do 250 PhD students um, and then the PGTAs we, we do group coaching for challenges, problem based learning challenges as groups of students of as groups like between 10 and 12 and that's across the whole 800 students over a two week period. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty great. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing it. And thank you for giving us the idea. It's probably important to say this is because of the group size, all of you are at different points. I'm hearing some of you that have a lot of experience with using strengths on your campus and some of you who have ambitions to have a lot of experience with strengths on campus. So keep in mind, we're, we're going to stay connected. So anybody that really wants to do this work, you'll have a chance to connect with me. I'll help you with any way that I can, but also this networking going sideways, because it sounds like Beth and Alyssa and Jan have already got some, some good things cooking at their schools. That sound good to everybody? Yeah. Can I suggest something else that, um, it, it might work in all your organizations. It's a, it might be unique for me. I don't know. I work at a medical center, so um, they're all graduates, medical students, nursing students, um, postdocs. And um, what I have found is each of the different pockets of things usually have some sort of professional development series for either their students or our medical school after every eight weeks has a special um, enrichment module where students get to pick what they want. So I've been able to incorporate strengths into each of those different types of basically professional development opportunities for the students. So if you yes. look for, um, in, you know, places like that in your um, organization, it's another way to expose them. Yeah, that, Cheryl, what you're doing right there, uh, I talk about, I think about this anytime I'm in front of an audience, but particularly an audience of students. And you have to be able to detail, uh, it's an acronym I call WIFM, but what's in it for me? Why should I take this assessment? Why should I do any of the activities that you suggested? But when you have that answer for them, and it's something that they're interested in, that professional development, leadership development, career exploration, then you've created that you basically just open it up. You're like what's in it for you? Like, well, you're probably going to be working for the next 50 years. So <laughs> to do something that you absolutely love and that takes full advantage of your natural talents or you'll be shining my shoes, yeah. your choice. But what also made it easy to do is these, these different lecture series, development series, enrichment modules, have already been um, in place. It's a structure I didn't have to create. So since it was already there, I was just able to be inserted as one of the, the speakers, basically, or for several sessions, just depending on, on the level of um, interaction they want to do. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, talk about something that is also really easy to do. And the more you do it, the more you're gonna find out that students are just gonna straight out forget. Forget their login, forget their password. They're, it sounds funny, but many of them, oh, I don't wanna reset my password. I don't wanna do all that work. It's at least 45 seconds of my life and I just, I can't do it. So almost all of them have one of these. Just have them when they finish, have them take a picture of it, add it to their notes. Or you can assign it to a contact if they just want to put the five words. But it's the access to the results that you really, really need in order to have the, co the coaching conversations or the professional development like Cheryl's talking about. 
So even if they lose the paper, even if they forget their login, they're not, they're not gonna forget this. They're not going anywhere without this. And if they do, they'll just get another one. Yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? Absolutely. Yeah, quick, best practice. You, you can scan it in the notes section. You could take a picture of it, click the little heart on the iPhone, add it to the favorites. You can make it your lock screen. But these are the small things that make that information easy to retrieve that will empower you to have the learning, the development, the coaching conversations. Everyone cool with that? Sure. Ashley Kurt, you cool with that? Okay. All right. Now let's talk, I'm gonna talk about one more thing in regards to storage and retrieval, and then we're gonna open it up to, to questions. All right, let me do one more screen share. I like to talk while I'm setting up the screen share so then it doesn't seem like you're waiting that long. That's, that's just a pro tip for everyone who uses Zoom. This right here is just a reminder that you're likely gonna have to make this something that's uh, the thing to do. So if any of you are in Florida and have access to artists like Pitbull, if you can get him to give like a shout out on Instagram and say, yeah, strengths is where it's at, do that thing that he does with his hand, you know what I'm talking about? All of those things, it's small, but it influences students to do the thing that you want them to do. Beautiful. Okay. I, anyone familiar with this? Anyone got this system? Some old school banner? Do it. Let me do a stop share. See, raise your hand if you use anything like PeopleSoft, Banner, student records. Okay. It, an advanced technique is to transfer those results, if you can, into part of the student's record because then anybody can have access to and help the student retrieve the results. Okay. That's an advanced technique, but I think some of you are there. And if you're not doing it, it's just one more opportunity that will make it easier because a student may take it like they're doing it that first year. But if they don't take a certain class or have any more conversations about it, they may forget it. They may forget it in a semester. But if it's in there, they won't, you don't have to expend the resources of them taking the assessment again. So one, you save money. And secondly, you save the student's time and yours. You're like, oh yeah, let me just look that up. Uh, Ken, how do you get around, um, get the approval of students to do that? Well, for, I, well, in the United States, we've got uh, FERPA, but everybody who would have access to the student's records does have an educational interest, just like any other assessment. So whether they were to do a career assessment or I mean, truly anything that you keep. I think sometimes we get a little nervous about it, but truly you have a, an educational interest. I don't know how it works in the UK, but I know here, everyone that, that does that, my school did it, I implemented it there. I do it in Texas, they do it in Kansas. Mm, interesting. You have to go yeah. through the ethics committee in the UK and also yeah. comply with GDPR. So it's a few hurdles. Yeah, but again, the framing is important. I know we live in a society now that's you know quick to think about like what's the worst thing that could happen, but also the primary objective is to help the student learn and grow. This is something that helps the student learn and grow. Okay, now let's open it up for questions. Not all at once though. Can I go first? I don't. I'll kick it off. Um, I'm getting ready to next week, I'm doing a, like an hour presentation and Q&A with um, the Career Services. It's sponsored by Career Services Department at a university that I'm working with. 
and it's for students and alumni. So I would just like to hear from you, other people, other coaches in higher ed, what um, what students appreciate about strengths, what they're struggling with right now, like being home with their parents, be after having a little bit of independence, or um, you know, just love to hear if you have anything that you know of that students are struggling with or looking for uh, that I could work with. I would appreciate um, hearing what you're hearing on campus. Okay. I heard two questions. One, applications related to career services. And then the other is the, with yeah. everything that's happening right now. So the first. Oh, sorry, did I talk about? No, we, we just lost you. Your reception is poor. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I just am wondering what you guys are hearing from students what's going on in their lives right now. And, um, you know, if you were giving a presentation to all the students and alumni at your school, how, what would you include? You can't hear me? No, we heard you. I was just saying, uh, if oh. anyone had time to, to say, I, I have some remarks, but it's, I would I would use the kiss method uh, to keep it keep it simple, and yeah. it's it's asking them, you know, are there ways that they can feed or use their strengths in the current situation, and just ask them to be creative. Is there something that someone else can do that would help them? If you lead with high input, learner context, or intellection. Who needs to know all of that information that you have? What are productive applications of using that? If there are students who have high relationship building talent, you ask, what can you do? What will you create the opportunity in order to establish connections with people or reconnect with people who fill you up? Awesome, thank you. Yeah. It's very simple. The larger the audience, the more broad you have to go. One yeah, of my something too. Sorry, we have one of my university um, clients. I do a workshop for them for with their, it's a mentoring program for women in engineering, and I do the mentors and the mentees. So over the lockdown, I've I've been doing some mood booster one hour webinars for them, which is doing that kind of thing. How are you riding the Corona coaster? Um, and just giving them an opportunity to kind of um, have small breakout rooms to chat. So we've done two, we've got another one at the end of this month. And they've, they've really valued that opportunity to just connect because they've all been locked down with their parents or away from their home and isolated in halls. Um, and they've had exams and they've got the stress about what's going to happen. So it, it, it gives a language to talk about noticing what themes are hurting and, and which ones are the ones that they can use to boost them out of the situation. So that's been really good. That is good. Thank you. What other questions? We got I think about uh, seven or 10 minutes left. I'm wondering if anyone has any really successful ways that they have advertised and caught students' attention enough to take strengths out of a required scenario. So they don't have to do it for a course, but it's just you advertising in a catchy way, like Ken said, Pitbull. I'd love to learn that. I tried to pilot this this year in a non-required format and it didn't go so well. So I thought like, maybe we can use Otto the Orange, our mascot, but everybody does that. So looking for any <laughs> expertise ideas around that. Is it okay if I speak up? Sure. Yeah. Um, Ashley, we should connect. Um, it's Andrea Davis. Um, I run a small um, clinical leadership challenge. Um, so all of our um, 
students who participate are voluntarily participating. Um, and sign up, you know, is always kind of a hurdle, I think, um, that we kind of go through, like in terms of like, you know, like advertising, who to advertise to. Um, but I mean, the title itself kind of attracts from our anecdotal experience, um, people, people that have um, lots of talent in the influencing um, arena. So maybe like thinking about like how, how you, uh, how you advertise it. Um, we actually have three pillars to our leadership program as well. Um, one of them is um, communication, um, self-awareness and relationship building. Um, so those pieces can attract people as well from other domains. Um, so yeah, just if you wanna connect, we can chat about uh, ideas. Yeah, Andrea is, is spot on there. We, we have a lot of campuses that effectively use their campus leaders. It's a strengths-based approach. If you have access to people who have high influence, people like Charlotte, high woo, then ask them to pull the others because that's, they want to do that anyway. And the other part is to, is to, you can also appeal to like why they're there. For some people, are you at Syracuse, Ashley? Okay. It's something to think about. So uh, whether that's journalism or whether it's business, but it's like thinking. It's like, hey, if you were looking to go into blank, strengths is a tool that's used by 90% of Fortune 500 companies. And if that's the kind of organization and the culture that you're drawn to, you can get a jump on it right now. Yeah, I, I lead with high woo, so I'm a sell it, don't tell it. What again? What's in it for me? I answer that. One thing in corporate organisations, you know, if you can find the others that are, you know, that that love it, that are going to spread the word, regardless of the mediums, it's it's on, and that helps. I often find it's the maximizers, the individualizations, the woos that go, oh my god, this is great. And you just say, hey, hope you think it's great. Tell somebody else that it's great. You know, spread the word. I can really use your help here to kind of, you know, get other people to take it. So, yeah, you, use those people. Hey, hey, hey Ken, uh, I have a suggestion for the what's in it for me. I always say the, the, number, the, the one radio station everybody's listening to is WIIFM. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. It's real good. Yeah. What's in it? Yeah, I like it. Now, what I have a question, if, if you guys don't mind. Uh, what other assessments do you find are most popular on campus right now? Are, are, the, are the kids taking other assessments? What, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know. It depends on the discipline. We do use, in a leadership class, I co-teach with the president of the college, we use the emotional intelligence assessment. So if you're familiar with emotional intelligence 2.0, and then we use StrengthsFinder. So we use both of them. Yeah. And that class has about 100 students. I mean, is it, thank you. It is, is, uh, is like DISC or Myers-Briggs, anything like that? Or is that more, that's more of a professional type of a situation probably? I would like I to, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, there are several career centers still effectively use the MBTI and in some sort of interest inventory. There's a lot Could of I just, schools here as well that use the, um, I think it's very popular here in Australia, the values in action, so the VIA assessment, and it's touted as well, it's free. So, you know, discover your strengths, use the VIA assessment. Um, what what is that veer or mirror via so values in action v-i-a okay but of course yeah, okay. strength is the best one so you know we recommend that there's no it. doubt <laughs> it, it can can you have switched can, now to get can your I full have, report it costs 20 dollars say that one more time laura VIA has switched now to get your full report. It's $20. You only get an abbreviated, very small report for free now. Okay. Good to know. 
very positive language with that too. So let me announce that it is, it's 529. And for those that want to stick around for say another five or 10 minutes and ask a question or two, I'm happy to stay if Charlotte would be good enough to stay. Always here for a party, anybody that wants to stay. I just like to say it's been great information, Ken and Charlotte. Thank you for having us. Really terrific. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, welcome, George. We hope to see you at another one. And, uh, let, let us know what other topics are useful to you. We're trying to have a, a community-led. The summit was amazing, um, but there's you know a wealth of information from other coaches out there. So how might we have a platform where coaches can share with each other and learn from each other. So anybody that has anything they want to share, let me know. If there's anything in particular that you want to hear about or hear from or, or do or practice, let me know. And again, I'll just, I'll just set it up. Thank you, Charlotte. That's very generous. Very, uh, very thoughtful. It's my room. <laughs> I think we're, how many, how many continents are we covered here? I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. You think about it. Yeah, I think the majority are US, but we've got a, a, a number of people in the UK that it's uh, probably getting late in the UK. I think I'm probably the only one from, from Australia on today. Sometimes we have some New Zealand people, but yeah. I sometimes do another one in my time evening, which covers Amir and other parts of Asia Pack as well. But we've got the hardcore uh, Amir people here today, so. <laughs> Yeah. Could I and share I, a quick story about a success using Clifton Strengths as a, as a college student? Hey, George, stay with us for just a minute because it sounds like you want to hang out. I just want to make yeah. sure. Before, okay, good. Make sure if there's anyone else that had a, a question that you had a chance while we're still on the line. Richard, just, yeah. right now, Sorry, Ken. Richard just made a good statement about um, Marcus Buck. Ma uh, Oh, that nearly came out wrong. That would have been embarrassing. Marcus Buckingham um, is preparing to offer free to students. Okay, so yeah. Oh, the standout. Yeah. And yeah. and there's a thousand assessments free on standout every day at the moment. Yeah. That's awesome. Wow, that's great. Thanks, Marcus. If you haven't already, just find me on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook and send me a message and we can we can have those side conversations because I know some of you it's like you have a very specific question but you want more than a 10 second answer. Any other questions, tips, hints, observations before George shares his story? My, my story is pretty quick. I mean, it's not, <laughs> it's, uh, Okay, let's hear it, George. Okay, so my, I have a 21 year old daughter who just graduated from Le Moyne College in Syracuse. Okay, and about three months ago, she said to me, Dad, you know, I'm a marketing major. Uh, I'm not sure if I should try to get a job in sales or marketing. Cause she, and I knew that she had these innate, uh, you know, people skills that maybe she would be good at, at sales. So I had her take the strengths assessment, all 34. Turns out she's a woo, she's a communicator, she's a presenter. She's, you know, all the things that you'd look for personality wise in a salesperson. And I, I know this cause I, that's kind of my forte is sales organizations. So fast forward, COVID comes up about what, three and a half months ago. So right after she takes the strengths assessment and I go through the coaching session, she understands her 34, uh, COVID hits. She has to fly back home from uh, Syracuse, leaves all of her stuff in her dorm or an apartment. Yeah, and you know the, the disruption that all the kids have gone through that are graduating in particular. So anyway, she starts interviewing with the company two and a half months ago a pharmaceutical company. She has 10 interviews. In just about every one of these interviews, I coached her to, to mention to them that, because the, the question was, why do you want to get into sales? 
You don't have any experience in sales. And typically pharmaceutical companies do not hire kids out of college, especially kids that don't have any sales experience. So the question by, by just about every interview she had, again, she had tech, is why sales? What makes you think you'll be good at sales? And so she talked to them about the Clifton strengths and about her specific top talents. And just about every interview she had, this made a very big impression because it turns out they're a big strengths company. They also do DISC and a few other assessments. Long story short, her commencement was supposed to be May 17th. She was offered a job a, a month before she actually graduated from college. So she finished her college uh, courses online, of course. She started working full time a week before she was supposed to graduate. And I'm very pleased to say that her, 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 her salary is probably at the very upper tier of what graduating students from Lemoyne College are receiving. So to me, that's a very strong strengths success story for students. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice work. Great timing. And uh, those stories actually do resonate with students. Uh, so we would call that that's qualitative. Capturing those stories are really, they can be influential in getting other folks to, to take the assessment and do the coaching. I think okay. I people that I've ever heard say that they use strengths in their either their CV resume or in their interview. I've only ever heard success stories from that. I've only ever heard, oh, I got the job and I'm sure it was because I talked about my, you know, my, my strengths. Um, again, whether I just have a, you know, lucky positive ratio, but you know, some people go, oh, you know, had a conversation prior to an interview and how they could articulate how they would use their strengths to, you know, apply to the role. Um, so yeah, I think that would be a, a great hook for students as well, but I'm sure you guys already do that. Yeah, it, it is. My background is in career advising, career counseling, and it's just, it's a pretty natural fit. Cool. Before I hop off, I just want to say thank you to everyone for, well, to Charlotte for hosting, Ken for presenting, and um, just to everyone that's working in higher education full time using strengths. Um, I was first introduced to strengths my freshman year as part of, part of our orientation week. So hearing that other schools are still doing that and um, that, that you all are continuing to provide opportunities for your universities to, to go beyond just introducing strengths and continuing to apply it in, in so many different ways is very encouraging for me to hear. Um, I know if I if my school would have had continuing development opportunities with strengths when when I was a freshman, my life I'm thankful for my life, but it, it I could have right got a lot stronger, a lot faster, um, a lot sooner, and so I just am really grateful for what you're all doing. So thanks and thanks for having me. Thank you. Great. Beautiful. Okay, well, if there are no other thoughts or questions, I'll thank each one of you for attending and for contributing your ideas. There's a lot of good thank stuff. You. Thank you.